All right. Awesome. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, the Open Source Industrial Revolution. It's uh, Marcin Jakubowski. Okay, sound on, okay, good. First of all, to gauge my level of teaching, preaching to the choir here, who's, who's heard of the Global Village construction set? Like maybe, not most, okay, good. So, this is great. Okay, so my name is Marcin. I'm a farmer, technologist, generalist. I was born in Poland, now in the US. I started a group called Open Source Ecology. And we took on a very big, hairy, audacious goal. We've identified the 50 different industrial machines that it takes for modern life to exist. The common tools we rely on every day, whether we know it or not, everything from a tractor to an oven to a circuit maker. Then we create an open source DIY version that anyone can build and maintain in a fraction of the cost. We call it the Global Village Construction Set. So is this reinventing the wheel here? Yes. <laughs> well, let me tell you a story. So I was born in Poland. That's, uh, came to America when I was 10. But my, so my, my grandmother was in a concentration camp. My grandfather was in a Polish underground derailing, derailing German supply trains. And this is what I've seen when I was 10. This is the streets in Poznań my hometown. This wasn't a parade. This was the real time of material scarcity behind the Iron Curtain. So then things got better. I moved to America, got into Princeton, and ended up with a PhD in fusion from University of Wisconsin-Madison. And then I discovered that I was useless. <laughs> so I had no practical skills. The world presented me with options, and I took them. I always thought about. Um, I couldn't forget about all the things I, I learned in my past about the power of science and technology to make life better. And the farther I went in my education, the less useful, the less competent I felt about doing anything for, for the world. So things like, never forgot about the terrible things that happen when people fight over opp opportunity where, where resources are scarce. So that's my for, some, some of my formative times. So I started a farm in Missouri and learned about the economics of farming. I bought a tractor, and then it broke. I paid to get it repaired. Then it broke again, and pretty soon, I was broke too. So I realized that the truly effective, low-cost tools that I needed to build a sustainable life and settlement just didn't exist yet. And I figured out that I would have to build them myself and for anyone else in the same position as I. So if I were going to do, if I were going to do that, I would need, need tools that are robust, modular, highly efficient and optimized, low cost, made from local and recycled materials, designed for a lifetime, not obsolescence. I found that I, have to, I would have to do this myself, and I did just that. And what I found was that industrial productivity can be achieved on a small scale. So then published the 3D designs, schematics, instructional videos, and budgets on a wiki. And then contributors from all over the world began showing up, prototyping new machines during dedicated project visits. So far, we've prototyped 16 of the 50 machines, and the project has begun to grow on its own. There, there have now been 12 replications in five countries around the world. So this is in Guatemala with a, with a tractor, in China with a brick press, Italy, Turkey, United States, this is our prototype four of the tractor, which we built last year. We're moving on, prototyping one after another. This is prototype five. This is now at the R School at Blair Grocery Project in New Orleans in urban agriculture as a pilot project. 
So wow, I thought this is great. <laughs> well, we can start the open source industrial revolution. Things are falling into place. And then <laughs> I was a little disappointed or hopes were <laughs> trashed here. This actually happened. The open source industrial revolution actually happened during the first industrial revolution with the case of the steam engine, believe it or not. So this is a story of James Watt and credited as the, as the inventor of the first practical industrial steam engine. He patented his invention, and well, you can say it was closed source. And it's the story of Richard Trevithick, another fellow who came about 30 years after that. And this guy happened to publish his designs openly with, uh, with the, Corn the Cornish tin miners. It was a story where they had a bad itch to scratch with the Watt engine because that design was proprietary and closed. They could, they could not, one, not afford the license fees, and they could not make improvements or modifications to meet their own needs. So, but the remarkable that result that happened was, this is the data point on, on, a, on an innovation rate with closed versus proprietary development. So this is the first part is the time of Watt. You can look at those closed squares. Compared to Wolf and Trevithick, uh, once they pretty much open sourced the engine. And what turned out was the, the annual rate of increase of the engine was about 9% in, in uh, Trevithick's time compared to about 4% in the time of Watt. So at that time, there's a real live discussion on alternative forms of intellectual property, questioning whether the, the, the patents which were intended to increase innovation were actually working. The answer was clear, but Nonetheless, throughout history from, say, the 1880s to 2000, this is the number of patents that are popping up everywhere. So the point is that it's up to us to put a little balance to this, to this game here. Uh, we're lucky to have been put pretty much, get a lot of attention, positive attention since my TED talk that was in 2011. But the question remains, I mean, how do you tap this wild mass of people to, to do development that matters? So it's about developing processes to do this. People like Amanda have talked about it, and it's a, it's a great, huge question. We're developing our own processes. To how, do, how do we do that? We just hired four people, four full-time staff to our project. And, um, but the question still remains. So what we're doing right now is We've seeded all our projects, the 50 different machines, on a platform called Dozuki, which actually uses an open documentation standard. And the point of this is that for each machine, we break it down. We go to the machine development page. And then further, we break it down into modules. So we go about module-based design, where you're basically breaking up a very hard problem, i.e. creating civilization from scratch into bite-sized chunks. That's, that's how, how we're doing by module-based design, where each of these can be devised and uh, documented and developed in parallel. We're also breaking down from the 12 different modules. Each one goes through about 100 development steps. So we're trying to figure out this whole messy process. Uh, we make three prototypes for each machine. So it totals up to about 150,000 item, itemized steps for the entire project to happen. Now, we're using the Wikipedia model of basically a small core team managing a much greater development process. Now, Wikipedia has managed to pull together about half a million articles per year. And if we assume that each article is about the amount of development effort for one step of our 150,000 step <laughs> uh, complete development, then if we achieved what Wikipedia does, then we would finish the entire project in one third of a year. There's encouragement there. But hardware is a little more complex than software, than creative work or articles, because you have to have the physical plant. The, you have the so-called compiler problem, where with software, it's another piece of software that converts the code, the raw code, into useful software. Here, the device which trans translates your blueprints into real devices is the tools of production. It's the, for us, it's the open source microfactory. And that part, uh, that's, that's the hard part. However, the, there is good news about this, and that is that the vast majority of the steps in open hardware development is still, 
it's primarily design to generate the blueprints, get all the information, the bills of materials, procedures, and everything else. Uh, there's, a, there's about 90%, at least 90% of the effort comes before you actually build. So there's hope that this method can scale. And we've done that, actually. So, so by applying these kinds of methods of breaking down machines into modules, we've built, for example, this machine. It's an automated compressed earth brick press uh, in a single day. So that has occurred on December 18 of, of 2012, just last year. And basically, by breaking the machine into modules, where you define a clear interface between the modules and then build every component in parallel, then you can use a larger team and you can turn it into a social production model and then assemble everything together at the end of the day in rapid time. So this actually makes sense, and, and it could make economic sense. For example, with the machine here, we've, we're charged, well, the cost, the materials cost is $4,000. We've actually sold a few of these machines at $9,000, and the nearest closer, closest competitor is about $52,000. So the economics make sense. So that's a brief overview of, of how we develop things. And if you'd like to get involved in this Apollo project, uh, I mean, I personally would like to see this uh, completed by the end of 2015, and pending delivery of certain milestones, of course, like getting our development techniques right. Um, but the way you can get involved, I encourage all of you to do so, is um, we have design sprints just about every Saturday where you get a bunch of people on Google Docs doing design work using very lowbrow tools like SketchUp that everyone has access to to do 3D design and things like that. So if you just fill out a simple uh, skill survey, you can join us on, on every Saturday. Uh, we also have people on site. We're in Missouri. This is the house that we built with our bricks, with our brick press and tractors. This is our workshop here that you've seen. And currently, we're building a micro house. Uh, this structure here, which is actually a reward, part of the reward structure from Kickstarter that we're delivering about two years after the fact. <laughs> Any of you signed up for that from this uh, audience here? <laughs> I saw one or two. OK. Yeah, but that's actually happening September 28th. So I actually invite you to contact me, marchin at opensourceecology.org. Uh, we're holding this workshop on September 28th, and we'll build this very simple structure in a, in a few days of time. So I welcome any of you to, to do that. It's uh, going to be a couple of day build, a few, few days to do so. So that's the, we, we'd like to develop our infrastructure to 24 people, full-time people, on site by the end of next year. Now, also, our roots go back deeply to crowdfunding. This is, our, this is true fans, our true fans. Once I was broke with the machines breaking down, then we started crowdfunding. Right now, we have about 400 people contributing about $10 a month for two years. And this stuff is important. So Aben, Aben Moglen talked about why we need to do this. And the facts are 80% of the economy is in material production. So while apps and software are, are all good, the reality, the physical reality, is 80% physical production, probably will be so for as long as we can see it. And also, OK, can we get the, is the, can the vol volume go up on this thing? I just want to show you this. It's also, the open hardware is related to all these different issues regarding material security, from food security, um, things like wars and wars and peace, the uh, environmentalism, the natural resources which, are, which provide the feedstocks for all that, that is required for a modern standard of living. When you really think about it, all of the wealth that we enjoy today for a modern standard of living relies on rocks, soil, sunlight, plants, water. Those are all abundant, yet the productive mechanism of society is what makes it scarce, artificially so. What if we can survive and thrive up to a modern standard of living and not only that, at two hours a day of work and from local resources. How would that be? OK, so that's, that's the reason for open source hardware. My time is up. But basically, my, from my childhood, I've been thinking about freedom. And I think that the immense power of open hardware to do so has yet to be tapped. And I encourage all of us to work together on that. Thank you very much. Yeah.